Hello again, everyone. This is Dr. Matecki, and I'm going to break down some of the material in the Mankey Chapter 4 on uh, monetary policy, money, banking, money creation, all sorts of cool topics. So without further ado, let's dive into it. All right, so in this chapter, there's a lot of things I'm not going to talk about directly in the video, like some of the basics about the definition, the types of money, and that sort of thing. So um, that's all stuff you've learned in Principles of Macroeconomics. So go through and read that. If you have any questions, let me know, but I'm not going to include that in the video. So we're going to focus on a couple of different things. We're going to talk about um, the banking system, and we're going to look at some bank balance sheets and talk about how banks uh, play an integral role in the, in the money supply. And then we're going to turn to a model of the money supply and see how the central bank is involved in controlling the money supply. So remember, the control of the money supply by the Federal Reserve we call monetary policy. And we will see that the Federal Reserve is not the only entity that decide, uh, determines the size of the money supply. Households and banks also play a key role in determining the size of the money supply. So just a quick refresher on monetary policy. So monetary policy is conducted by an institution called uh, the central bank. And so our central bank in the United States is called the Federal Reserve. Um, the United Kingdom has the Bank of England. The European Union has the European Central Bank. So there's lots of these institutions around the world. Um, the primary tool that the Federal, uh, Federal Reserve uses to control the money supply is what we call an open market operation. So remember, this is the purchase or sale of government bonds from banks. So essentially what the Fed would do if they want to increase the amount of um, uh, liquidity in the system, what they will do is purchase government bonds from banks. And in, in return for those bonds, the Fed is going to increase uh, the amount of liquid reserves in the system. And so thereby increasing the, the amount of uh, funds that are available for lending in the economy and we're going to see how the banking system plays a key role in, in turning those open market, market operations into additional money. Uh, and just the opposite is true. If the, if the Federal Reserve wants to shrink the money supply, they will sell government bonds. And so they're going to suck liquidity out of the system. Essentially, what happens is banks use some of their liquid resources to purchase bonds from the Federal Reserve. And so... Um, what we see is a reduction in reserves and liquidity in the banking system, which ultimately leads to a smaller money supply. And so that whole process is what we're going to talk about. So how does a change in deposits in the banking system, how does that impact the money supply? So I mentioned the term liquidity in that last, on that last slide. Uh, so let's just be clear about what liquidity means. Liquidity means um, how, how easily can an asset be turned into a form that can be used to buy something for a purchase. So something like currency, which is the actual paper money and coins and things that are floating around, this is extremely liquid. We can use these for purchases immediately. But we also have things we commonly use to purchase things like savings and checking accounts, uh, we can write a check or use our debit cards. And so these are things that are called demand deposits. We can very easily spend the money in these accounts without any sort of advance notice. We can just use our debit card or uh, a check and um, immediately access those funds. So uh, our different measures of the money supply are grouped by liquidity. So currency is the most liquid. And then we en end up having more and more broad measures of the money supply that become a little bit less liquid. So M1 is the second most liquid grouping of assets. And so this includes like your checkings and savings accounts and those sorts of things. M2 is a little bit more broad measure. And this includes things that are a little bit harder to access, like a money market mutual fund, even though you can uh, oftentimes write checks and things off of these deposits. These might be um, time deposits that require you to keep the money in the account for a certain amount of time. Uh, before you can access them and that sort of thing. So not quite as liquid, but still relatively liquid. Um, and so you can see what most people think of, of money. This is probably the dollar bills and coins. This is actually a small fraction of the overall money supply. So most of the time when economists are referencing the money supply, they're talking about M2. So we're talking um, $20 trillion worth of uh, money, if we're talking about M2, where we only have about $2 trillion worth of currency, uh, uh, paper dollars and coins floating around. 
So what what is actually what uh, money to economists is much more than just the bills and currency, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. There's often a question also of, well, which one of these measures of the money supply should we use? Which one is the best? Well, it really depends on which measure of money is, um, you know, most closely correlated or related to the variables that we are interested in studying. Uh, traditionally, M2 has been um, the money supply that makes the most sense for economists to study, but there are additional measures of the money supply like M3 and um, even broader measures that um, are not mentioned in the text. Um, so it really just depends on the use and what we're trying to study. So M2 and M3 are, are probably the most common, but M1 is still used for some things. So it uh, really just depends on the situation. So based on those definitions of the money supply, we can see that banks are going to be an important uh, piece of the puzzle when we're talking about the monetary system and money supply. So, for instance, in M1 and M2, it's not just currency that's part of the money supply, but it's also our demand deposits, like our checking accounts. And so big M here stands for the money supply. Money supply is equal to currency plus those deposits. Um, and so that, that's really the simple uh, connection here between banks and the money supply. So we're going to build a lot of definitions, and um, this is going to be the most basic one we're going to start with. So in a second, we're going to look at a typical bank balance sheet, but uh, let's get a few definitions out of the way. So when we're looking at these things, we know what we're talking about. Uh, so a balance sheet is um, uh, a way to look at a business's liabilities and assets, uh, the balance, balancing part of this means that liabilities and assets must equal each other. Uh, so when we're talking about a bank, what are the liabilities and assets? Well, um, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but for a bank, deposits are liabilities. So remember, liabilities are things you owe people, right? So if someone uh, comes and deposits money, you have to be uh, ready to give that money back to the person, right? So you you owe that money to the person. That's not, you know... That's not yours to keep forever if you're the bank. So what the bank can do, though, is turn that deposit into an asset by loaning out um, some of those funds to other people. A loan is an asset because it can generate income. So the bank makes money by collecting interest on the loans. Um, any sort of um, part of that deposit that they keep um, aside as sort of cash we call reserves. So these are the portion of deposits that have not been lent. So again, these reserves are things that can be used to generate income by deposit them, depositing them at the central bank, the Federal Reserve. Um, <clears throat> and these can also just be used to, um, you know, ensure that you have uh, some liquidity in case something goes wrong. So when someone deposits money at a bank, typically a bank would use um, a portion of that deposit to generate income uh, to either uh, invest it in, in assets like stocks and bonds or um, create loans that will generate interest, but they don't put all of that deposit into um, activities like this. They keep some set aside as what we call reserves. So this is the portion of, of deposits that banks have not lent. And again, so it uh, can be used as a buffer, a safety, uh, safety net in case things don't go right with um, some of your investments. Um, it allows you to have money on hand if someone comes in and wants to take money out of their account. Um, so the reserves are just the, the portion of deposits that the bank keeps um, as liquid assets for day-to-day -day activities. If a bank did not loan out any of its deposits or, or use those to purchase things like stocks and bonds, then we would be operating in what we call a 100% reserve banking system. This is where banks hold all of their deposits as reserves and the bank basically amounts to a very safe uh, piggy bank. Um, how our banking system actually operates is um, on what we call a fractional reserve banking system. So this is a system in which banks just hold a portion of the deposits as liquid reserves. And so, again, reserves are essentially, you know, part of that is what we call vault cash. So there is literally some cash like sitting around in banks in case people come and get a deposit. But a large portion of the reserves are actually just funds that the commercial banks like Chase and uh, PNC, they have, um, they have these funds deposited at the central bank, so at the Federal Reserve.
With those definitions out of the way, now let's look at a simple bank balance sheet to help us understand how banks are involved in creating money. So let's first consider the case where we're going to have what we call 100% reserve banking. This is when the banks just keep all of their, their deposits in the form of reserves. So let's consider a situation where initially we have a household that's sitting on $1,000 worth of currency um, under their mattress in a piggy bank, wherever it is. Deposits are then zero, and so the money supply is equal to, remember, currency plus deposits, C plus D. So money is equal to 1000 So now let's suppose the household uh, decides to deposit their, their money from the piggy bank and take it to, the, to, to first bank instead. So now let's look at what the balance sheet looks like for first bank after the, after the deposit. And so remember, a balance sheet is just a chart showing assets and liabilities, and the two sides will equal each other. So remember, um, after the deposit, um, the bank is going to have liabilities totaling $1,000 because if that depositor comes back to the bank, the bank owes this money to the, to the person that deposited it. So it's a liability. However, they also now have $1,000 worth of cash sitting in their bank vaults. So theoretically, they could use this money to generate income. But if we're doing 100% reserve banking, then they're just going to keep it all as reserves and they're not going to loan any of this out or use it for investing purposes. So after the deposit, we now have no currency floating around. It's sitting at the bank. Our deposits are equal to a, uh, to a thousand, and the money supply C plus D is still equal to a thousand. So ultimately, the bank has no impact on the size of the money supply if we are using a hundred percent reserve banking. But we know that's not the case. So let's look at the more interesting case where we actually have what we call fractional reserve banking. So with fra fractional reserve banking, that's the next scenario we're going to look at here. The bank is not going to keep all of their deposits in the form of reserves. They're going to use some of that, uh, those reserves to generate income. So in this example, let's assume that they are going to hold 20% of deposits as reserve. Um, so their ratio of, de of, de of reserves to deposits is 20% or 0.2. Uh, and the rest, of, uh, the rest of those funds are going to use to make loans. So in this case, 80% of $1,000 is $800. So First Bank will make 800 in loans. So the, the deposits are, are still there. They're still a liability for the bank. So the $1,000 worth of liabilities have not changed. But on the left-hand side, we see the, the story is different now. So the bank is going to keep $200 lying around as reserves, and $800 will be loaned out. The money supply now equals $1,800. Why, you ask? Well, because there's still $1,000 in deposits. The depositor still has $1,000 that they can use for purchases, right? They could write a check uh, for the amount of $1,000 and purchase something. And now the bank has lent $800 to another, to another person, so this borrower also has $800 worth of funds that they can use to purchase something. So they can either deposit in their bank or they can um, give it to someone else and, uh, to buy something, right? So um, the key idea here is that this $800 is additional resources that can be used to purchase something. And that's what money is, right? It's, a, it's an asset that can be used to um, complete a transaction. The key lesson in a fractional reserve banking system, banks create money through the lending process. So now the person that received the loan of $800 from the first bank, let's say that they put it in their bank account in second bank, you know, so they're not really ready to use this to purchase something yet. So they're going to deposit it first in the, uh, with the intent of buying something eventually. So now we look at second bank's balance sheet. So this is just another commercial bank like Chase or PNC. So now the second bank has deposits of $800. And if they uh, operate under the same reserve sort of uh, strategy and keep 80% uh, aside for loans and 20% for reserves, they will keep 160, which is 20% of 800. They will keep this as reserves and they will loan out the rest to, to generate some income. So what has happened to the money supply now? Well, it's just increased by $640 because now another person is walking around with a check for $640 that they can deposit in their bank or use for purchases.
And this same process happens over and over again. So the deposit of $640 in yet another bank, and that bank can loan out 80% of that. So we've added another $512 to the money supply. And this same process happens over and over again. So all of this lending by these different commercial banks increases the money supply. So remember, we just had an initial deposit of $1,000. So this initial deposit of 1000 led to lending at all these different banks. And after we add that all up, the final money supply is much larger than 1000 To see how much larger than 1000 we can use a simple formula. If we look right here, 1 divided by RR, which is the ratio of reserve to deposits, we can develop what we call the simple money multiplier. This term out in front here, 1 divided by RR, is how much we would multiply the initial deposits by to figure out what the final money supply is going to be. So with a reserve to deposit ratio of 0.2, we would have a simple money multiplier of 1 divided by RR, which is 1 divided by 0.2, which is equal to 5. So if we have an initial deposit of $1,000, our money supply is going to be equal to 5 times 1,000, which is equal to 5,000. That's the number you see. Oops, that's kind of sloppy. The number you see right here. It's important to keep in mind this uh, caveat that while the uh, banking system does create money, it creates uh, additional assets that can be used for transactions. It does not create wealth. So when we have a bank loan, we're creating equal amounts of assets and liabilities. So there's no new, new net change to wealth, um, the amount of stuff that's out there that can be used to complete transactions is increasing. And that's really all we're doing is creating liquidity that can be used for purchases. So we can refine this balance sheet just a little bit to get some more insights into the operation of banks. So instead of just having assets and liabilities, now we are going to include owner's equity in our discussion here. So uh, owner's equity, or what we'll refer to as bank capital, uh, we just think of this as the resources the bank's owners have put into the bank. It's also the difference between the value of the assets and the liabilities. So the liabilities are things we, the bank would owe people, so the depositors could all come back and take out their $750. Um, the people we've borrowed from could uh, make us pay them back. So we would need at least $950 worth of assets to pay these folks back. So since we have $1,000 of assets on the left-hand side, we could pay all these folks back and still have $50 left over. Um, so that's this idea of bank capital. This acts as a sort of buffer against a decrease in the value of your assets. Reserves are more or less risk-free, but loans and securities uh, can, can vary in, in, in value. So your loans may not be paid back, so you might have someone default. Um, securities, uh, you know, the value is based on supply and demand, essentially, in the, in the stock market, the bond market. So the value of these securities could go down if the markets are doing poorly. Um, and, and so if, if these assets decline in value a little bit, you can tap into the uh, bank capital in order to ensure that you have enough money to pay back your, uh, your depositors and your, your lenders. So now notice that the amount of bank capital that we have 50 is small relative to the amount of assets. So this tells us that we must have gotten resources from somewhere else. In other words, we've acquired liabilities, this 950 that we've then converted into assets by using those, those, uh, those resources to, to write loans and to buy securities and those sorts of things. So a large portion of our assets were actually acquired using someone else's money in the form of their deposits or money that they lent to us. So that's, that's the idea of leverage, is using someone else's money or borrowed money to supplement your own funds that you've put in, right? You've put in the owner's equity, but we're using borrowed money to, to supplement those, uh, those existing funds so that you can have a larger operation, you can um, have more assets that can generate income. So the idea of the leverage ratio is looking at the, the amount of assets you have relative to your capital. So the amount of assets we have is just everything on the left-hand side, which is 200 plus 500 plus 300, right? So if we add those up, it equals 1,000. We divide that by the amount of capital, which is 50, and we get 20. So the bigger this number, the more highly leveraged you are. Uh, that's also sort of gives you an indication of, of how uh, risky the, the financial position of the firm is, because if you're using lots of other people's money, then if things go sour, then you have lots of things you need to pay back and lots of people coming after you.
It also means that if you have a decrease in the value of your assets, it does not take a large decrease to wipe out everything that you have put into the firm. It's the same way if you were to borrow a lot of money to invest in the stock market as an individual. It's not a very risky position, could have high returns, but also the proposition of very high losses. So being highly leveraged, in other words, makes banks vulnerable. So uh, let's suppose that we have a recession like we did in 2008 that causes bank loans and securities to fall by 5%. Um, so just sort of scenario happened in 2008 when we had um, uh, problems in the housing market, so people were not paying back their loans, and so lots of defaults, so the value of these loans decreased. We had lots of securities that were derived from the value of those mortgages. Those were called mortgage-backed securities. Banks were holding a lot of these as assets. Those things also dec declined in value. So you can see it just takes the fall of 5% um, in, in the value of our, of our uh, assets to $950. And our bank capital at that point is completely wiped out. So remember, we can just using the logic of this balance sheet, if these two sides have to equal each other, then if we take the assets and subtract all of the liabilities, then we're left with this category here, capital. So if capital is equal to assets minus liabilities, our assets are now worth 950. Our liabilities did not change. Our depositors still want all of their money back. Uh, and the people we borrowed money from certainly want all of their loans paid back. So in other words, our bank capital has uh, fallen to zero. So essentially, if bank capital is zero or negative, you are bankrupt. Um, and so this made firms very, um, very hesitant to take on additional risk because uh, they couldn't really suffer any additional losses in the value of their securities and their loans. So they didn't want to take on any additional risk. And so that decreased the amount of bank activity and lending and ended up in what we call a uh, credit crunch. Uh, and so since lots of people depend on bank liquidity to operate their businesses and just survive on a daily basis, this caused the economy to grind to a halt. So one of the big changes that came out of this financial crisis era of 2008 to 2010 were increased capital requirements for banks. So this uh, was a minimum amount of capital that was mandated by government regulators. Uh, and in fact, part of the rescue operations involved the government actually putting money into these banks in the form of capital. So essentially, the government was becoming part owner of these banks. Now that turned out to be a temporary thing, but uh, caused quite a bit of conversation at the time whether that was the right thing to do or not. But essentially, the these requirements ensure that banks have enough of a buffer to pay off their depositors, uh, to pay off their liabilities uh, in, the, in the event that something bad happens. Um, and so if you're a bank that tends to engage in risky activity, then you have even higher capital requirements. So the capital requirements are based on the types of things that you typically invest in. Um, and so this is, you know, the, the really short version of the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Losses on mortgages shrank bank capital, slowed lending, made the recession worse than it already was already. Right. So there was, you know, certainly uh, there was going to be uh, a decrease in consumption and and. And, and demand because of just the, the you know the the losses on the mortgages, but really what made this thing so bad was that it caused damage to the whole financial system and uh, essentially the lubrication to our economy was taken out and the, the gears sort of grew, you know ground to a halt. So these regulatory changes were aimed at reducing the overall riskiness in the in the banking system, um, and reducing the likelihood that we would have a future. Uh, credit crunch like we saw in 2008-2009.